Am I good to go up? Okay. Good morning, everyone. We are so happy to see all your smiling faces. Um, I know a lot of you have um, kids coming in today to sing for us, and we are so thankful and grateful that you guys are coming, and we are so excited to cheer your kids on. And so just a few things, just uh, housekeeping things. If you would like more information on the church in front of you in the pew, there's little cards that look like this. And so on the back there, you can put your name and information, and a member of leadership will be with you within a week. Um, and then also, um, for those of you who are regulars and are like, what in the world is going on today? There are so many people. We have special guests. Like I said, um, the preschool that meets here in the church, they, we're partnering up with them, and they're coming in and singing a couple songs for us because... Um, they're awesome, and I get to hang out with them all week, so all these kids, um, I, I know you guys don't get to see me as much because we're, we haven't been doing chapel and whatnot, but all your kids are incredible, and I have so much fun with them throughout the week, even though I'm technically not working for Kathy. <laughs> so why don't we open up in a word of prayer, and then we will get started. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for everything that um, you've done. And the, the, today's beautiful. Um, the fact that we get to be in communion with our partner, CEP, and get to be together with all these families and all these smiling faces and all these little smiling faces, I pray, Lord, that you just bless today. You use your Holy Spirit in whatever way you see fit. Um, and I pray that whatever um, Pastor Mike is preaching about, that the, you use the words to touch our hearts, Lord. And I pray all, this, all these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. All right. And without further ado... today is to celebrate Jesus and what he did for us and to celebrate Palm Sunday. The second reason we are here today is to thank First Christian Church for keeping their doors open for the last two years, for doubling our space so we could social distance at six feet and then down to three feet First Christian Church is the reason why this preschool has been keeping on, keeping on. So can we clap for them? So thank you and enjoy 
our two songs that we've prepared for you today.
we do. So right now, as these guys are headed out, if you are in K through first, then you can go with and line up with Miss Kathy and Miss Cheryl as well for Children's Church. So, we're going to let them dismiss real quick. All right, and then if you are in second through fifth, there's a little bit of a miscommunication about sign-in, which is okay, but um, we'll have make sure that your kids are all, all set and signed in and signed out. But if you have a second through fifth grader and you would like to come to Children's Church, if you would line up here in the center row, and then we are all going to go down and going to be in the fellowship hall, which for parents, if you just go right down this hall, we are going to be all the way at the end. So if you are in second through fifth grade, you are more than welcome to sign up, line up, and we're going to head to our children's church now. Um, I think they're Miss Kathy's, but I don't We'll be able to outdo those children in enthusiasm, but let's try it.
says in a favorable time I listened to you and in a day of salvation I have helped you behold now is the favorable time behold now is the day of salvation 2nd Corinthians 6 2 Romans 5 8 says but God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners Christ died for us and in Acts 22 16 and now why do you wait rise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on his home Pleasing sacrifice 
Good morning. This has been such an incredible, my heart is so full, <laughs> listening to the kids and just the words that they had to say to us that Jesus died for you, for me, and for you. And we just give God all the praise for that and thank him. Um, this is just such a a blessing to see all these wonderful faces here. Thank you for coming and thank you for sharing your children with us. That was absolutely fantastic. Kathy Schiffler is one of the best preschool teachers I think I have ever seen. Um, I have a couple of prayer requests from our congregation. One is for Jane Edwards, who is suffering with anxiety. So please keep her in your prayers. And the other is Riley Elsie, who's in hospice care. He's not doing well. I think he only weighs about 70 pounds. And so we need to keep him and his family definitely in prayer. Um, this morning has been just such a blessing. And I wanted to just read, this is Palm Sunday. And in Luke... 19, they tell us that um, they brought a cloak to Jesus. Jesus had sent them out to get a donkey and a cloak. They brought it, the disciples brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And I thought about that this week on Palm Sunday, um, that Jesus experienced that moment of everybody loving him and praising him and throwing their cloaks down in front of him and saying, Hosanna, praise the Lord. Following that, just a week later, they were saying, crucify him, crucify him. And then three days after that, he arose from the dead and then ascended into heaven to be with God. And I thought about our lives and sometimes how we have those moments of Hosanna, right? We feel everything is going right, we're, everything's good in our life, and you know those around us are treating us well, and we're just really happy. And then following that may come a dark time, as it did with Jesus. And then following that, if we have trust and faith in, in him, then again, we know the sun will shine. Joy comes in the morning. And we know that if we have faith in him, that we too will be ascending into heaven. And we will be spending eternity with our Lord. So during those dark times, just remember that looking forward, they're not going to last. Even if it feels like it, um, God is there and he's going to give us a great future with him. Um, so let's just go to prayer and pray to our God. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for these beautiful children, Lord, that you have given us. What a blessing. You said, let the children come into, unto me. They are so special, Lord. We ask that you bless them, protect them, and just keep them close to you, Lord. And Father, we... We just pray for so many today that are celebrating Palm Sunday. We ask that hearts will be touched, that hearts will be open to receive what you have for them, Lord. 
And we just thank you, God, for the, the beautiful blessing that you gave us for sacrificing your son to us so that we may spend eternity with you, Lord. And Father, I thank you for everyone that's here this morning. I ask that you bless each one. May their day be full of joy and full of the Holy Spirit, Lord. We thank you for your love. You surround us with your love each and every minute of every day, Lord. And that love is so powerful. It can see us through anything, Lord. If we just turn to you and accept what your son has done for us. Father, we pray for those who serve us each and every day in ways that are very dangerous, that they protect us, our fire, firemen, our policemen, Lord, our military, our EMTs. Father, all of those who just put their lives on the line for us, God. And we ask that you be with them and protect them. Just keep them safe, God. Father, as you taught us to pray, let us all pray that prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Stop temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
when we gather around someone's table for a meal, we go into someone's house for a meal and we gather around their table, we usually come there by an invitation. Someone invites us. They'll invite Tanya or Linda will invite Dale, something like that, when they gather around the table. And Jesus invites us to come around his table each Lord's Day to remember the death, burial, and resurrection. But when we come to the Lord's table, we come in submission. This is the last thing Jesus wanted to do. His prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane was, Father, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, your will be done, not mine. So we, we come at Jesus' invitation, but we come with a submissive spirit as well. We come with a spirit of surrender. The things that are on our heart, the things that are bothering us, the things that we've done this week, we submit those things and we surrender those things to Jesus when we come around his table each Lord's Day. As they pass the elements around this morning, I would ask that you would hold them until, until they come back. We'll pray for the elements and we'll take them together as the body of Christ this morning.
It was on the night that Jesus was betrayed. They took bread. He broke it. And he blessed it. Father in heaven, we thank you for this bread, which represents the broken body of your son, who took the punishment on our behalf for the forgiveness of our sins, that we might have the hope of eternal life in heaven with you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. When he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take and eat from this, all of you. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal, he took the cup and he gave thanks. Father, thank you for the sacrifice of your precious son. Each, each drop of blood shed on our behalf so that we could have the forgiveness of our sins. Lord, we thank you for the hope and the promise of heaven through the resurrection of your son. It's in his name I pray. Amen. He gave it to the disciples and he said, Take and drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, freely poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. I saw Karen gathering her books. I thought she was going to sing this morning. <laughs> Good morning. Now all the excitement you all had when the kids were up here and all the smiling and the laughing and the cameras out and all that, I expect the same thing <laughs> for the next 53 minutes. <laughs> I've never preached that long in my life. You'll be okay. Uh, while I do have your attention, though, it gets a little warm and I know we can get a little... Eyes get a little bit heavy during the message. Uh, I do want to remind you of a couple things coming up this week for the church. Uh, Thursday evening, we're having a Monday Thursday service here at the church celebrating uh, the Lord's Supper. That will be at 7 o'clock here at the church. It will actually be a, what would you call it, Kathy? A, a drama, a portrayal of the Lord's Supper. Uh, Saturday at 11, there will be an Easter egg hunt for the kids. Parents, you're welcome to come as well. We can hide our own eggs. <laughs> Sunday morning at 6.30, 6.30 a.m., not p.m., we'll have a sunrise service here on the corner of the parking lot. Uh, breakfast will follow that. 8.30, we'll have our Sunday school, and then 10 o'clock, we'll have our normal worship service. You're all welcome and invited to come and join us. Love to see it like this on, Chris, on Easter Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> on Easter Sunday as well. <laughs> okay, this morning, uh, we've been going through... Uh, the book of Acts, but we took a little break for April, for Easter, a couple sermons through the book of Luke, and we're going to see where Jesus found, showed grace and truth to several people in his word. Uh, This morning it's going to be Jesus showed grace and truth to a sinful woman. It'll be in Luke 7, starting in uh, verse 36, going through chapter, uh, verse 50. Luke writes, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him, So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman he is touching is touching him. She's a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? 
Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the, first, from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven, so she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, Who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Let's pray this morning. Father in heaven, as we learn from your word today, give us attentive ears, give us open hearts, that we might receive what it is that you have for us today to change our lives, to be more like your son. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. How glad are you this morning that you were born on this side of the cross? Think of the Old Testament saints who were required to live by the Ten Commandments. In one way or another, we have broken just about every one of them. We've not always put God first or worshipped Him correctly. We've sometimes slipped up and taken His name in vain. We've not rested one day in seven. At times, we've been disrespectful to our parents. We've even murdered people by holding hatred toward them in our heart. We've taken things we shouldn't have taken. We've told lies. And we've not been content with all the blessings that God has given. And our sins are not limited to what we did prior to becoming a Christian. We violated God's law many times since our baptism. So the Ten Commandments make us feel guilty to the point of wanting to crawl out of church. In Romans 3, verse 20, the Apostle Paul writes, This is one of the primary purposes of the law. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. God gave us the law as a mirror to reflect the dirt that's on us so that we would know that we need cleansing. The law was given so that we would feel guilty and know that we need a Savior. Once we know about God's law... We can better appreciate God's grace. John 1 verse 17 reads, For the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. The good news of the gospel is that we're not saved by perfectly obeying the Ten Commandments. We're saved by completely trusting the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Once we understand that truth, we can receive forgiveness and walk in joyful confident obedience. The woman in our text this morning desperately needed God's grace. She's a sinful woman who came to Jesus for forgiveness. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him, so Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. Then that day when an important teacher was a guest in somebody's house, the front door was left open and anybody who wanted to could walk in and listen to the conversation. The visitor was supposed to keep quiet, but they were welcome to come and observe. It was a tribute to the host if other people came in and hovered around. That meant that he had somebody important in his home. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard that Jesus was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Now don't confuse this incident with Mary, the sister of Lazarus, who later anoints Jesus' feet with an alabaster jar of perfume. The two incidents are similar, but they're different circumstances. Then she knelt behind Jesus at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. Now, we don't know very much about this woman, but we do know that she was a sinful woman. Most Bible scholars conclude that she was probably a prostitute, but maybe she had some other character flaw or some other addiction. Everybody in the town knew about her. She had a bad reputation, but she was a seeking woman. When she learned that Jesus was eating at the home of Simon, she went to the place where Jesus was. 
You know, most people who are trapped in some appalling behavior want to be free. Deep down, they want to go straight. They promise themselves, I'm not going to live like this the rest of my life. I'm really a better person than this. When I have children, I don't want them to be exposed to this. I'm going to change someday. And this sinful woman knew Jesus was calling people to a higher and better way of life. Deep down in her soul, she wanted that. So she went to where Jesus was. She was a repentant woman. There's an old Turkish proverb that says, no matter how far you've gone down the wrong road, turn back. And this woman was determined to turn back. She probably had heard Jesus teach before and she knew of his compassion. She knew he was a friend to the lowly. Being in the presence of Jesus that day, all of his holiness just convicted her of her own sin. And she began to weep tears of repentance. Now there are some people who can cry and have tears just roll down their cheeks and plop big old water drops on the floor. We've all seen that happen. This woman's tears dripped on Jesus' feet. And that day they reclined at the table and their feet would be behind them as they were at the table. And when her tears dropped on Jesus' feet, this woman instinctively tried to cover up her blunder by drying his feet with her hair. But in that day it was considered immodest for a woman to appear in public with loose hair. It was supposed to be bound up tight. But this woman was so impulsive, so expressive, that when her tears wet Jesus' feet, she attempted to dry them with her hair. Then she spontaneously kissed Jesus' feet and poured perfume on them. I love the way Jesus responds. When this woman sobbed and poured oil and kissed Jesus' feet, he responded with such graciousness, such warmth, such tenderness. He commended her. And he said, she loves a great deal. She's done a generous deed. She knows how to express appreciation. But Simon the Pharisee was embarrassed by it all. When the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Now keep in mind, when a man took a vow to be a Pharisee, he promised to obey the letter of the law. His whole life was devoted to living, not only according to the Ten Commandments perfectly, but to all of the Old Testament. All 613 laws. I can't even obey a speed limit sign. And although the Pharisees outwardly were very good people, they usually had a deep problem with their inner attitude. They were self-reliant, arrogant, judgmental, prideful. Six times in Matthew 23, Jesus called the Pharisees hypocrites. Remember, it was the Pharisees who brought the woman called in adultery to the feet of Jesus. And suggested that she be stoned. They didn't care about exploiting her. They were so lacking in grace. Bishop Fulton Sheen used to say, God prefers a loving sinner to a loveless saint. And Simon was a loveless saint. Who had a condescending attitude toward this sinful woman. He mumbled under his breath and he said to himself, If Jesus really were a man from God, he wouldn't let this woman touch her. He would reject her. But Jesus even responded to Simon with such grace and truth. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other, but neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? You see, Jesus not only knew about this woman's reputation, he also knew what Simon was thinking. The Bible says Jesus knows what is in the heart of man. And he knew that while the woman was guilty of sins of the flesh, Simon was guilty of sins of the spirit. Jesus knew that both of them were spiritually bankrupt. Neither of them was capable of paying back their debt of sin. The difference was not in the amount of sin. The difference was in the awareness of sin. So Simon replied, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. 
That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. William Barclay, in his commentary, points out that in that day, the host would always express hospitality to a respected guest with three acts of kindness. Today, we would shake their hand, put up their coat, and then get, offer them something to drink. But in that day, they would give the person the kiss of peace. That would be a mark of respect. It would never be omitted in the case of a respected rabbi. Secondly, since the roads were dirty and they wore sandals, they would have, they would have a basin of cool water at the door to comfort and clean their feet. And thirdly, they would take some sweet-smelling incense or a drop of perfume and place it on the guest's head. But Simon had a patronizing attitude toward Jesus, and he expressed none of these normal acts of kindness. Simon probably left the impression that Jesus was fortunate to be a guest in his house because he was that important. Or maybe he invited some of his Pharisee friends over to try and trap Jesus. Now Jesus was full of grace. He didn't storm out because Simon was rude. He didn't sit in a corner and pout. He reclined at the table and he ate. But when Simon displays disgust for this sinful woman and questions Jesus' authenticity, he responds truthfully. Look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with her rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven, so she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Haven't you observed that sometimes people who come to the Lord from a very disreputable background are more appreciative of grace and more expressive of love than those who've grown up in the church and never know the depth of their sin? Then Jesus said to the woman, Your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, Who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. You see, Simon saw a prostitute who was a nuisance. But Jesus saw a person in need. Isn't Jesus wonderful? Wouldn't you like to have that kind of balanced personality, grace and truth? I'm not there yet, but I sure would like to be. I read of instances like this and I think, boy, it's going to be good someday to see Jesus face to face and to be like him. The means by which this woman received forgiveness from Jesus has some practical applications for each of us when we're convicted of sin. The first thing we need to do when we feel like crawling out of church is to come where Jesus is. This woman may have felt out of place in the home of a self-righteous Pharisee. People may have told her, you don't belong with Jesus, he's good. But she went to where he was anyway. When you know that you've sinned, Go to the place where you're most likely to meet Jesus. You won't feel like doing that. You won't feel like going to church. You won't feel like listening to Christian music on the radio. You won't feel like reading the Bible. It's kind of like taking medicine when you're sick. It's counter to your feelings, but it's what you need. So the first step in healing is you come to where Jesus is. J. Vernon McGee says when he was in high school, he started running with the wrong crowd. He got in some trouble one day and he was called to the principal's office with the other boys. He was petrified of getting a whipping from the principal. One of his friends gave McGee some advice. He said, when the principal comes at you with that strap, don't move away from him. That gives him more leverage and it hurts more. He's right. (laughs) Even though you don't feel like doing it, if you move closer to him, it won't hurt as much because he won't have as much leverage. McGee says the same truth applies when we have rebelled spiritually against God. The farther you get away from the Lord, the more painful it becomes. And even though it goes against our carnal nature, move closer to Him, and it won't hurt nearly as much. 
The prodigal son was so wounded, so hurting and so desperate, living in the far country. Finally, he said, I know what I'll do. I'll go back to my father. And it quit hurting. Jesus invites you to come even in your sin. In Matthew 11, verse 28, he said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I'm humble and gentle at heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Sin's burden is heavy. Jesus' burden is light. Once you come to Christ, the second thing we need to learn from this woman is to allow ourselves to be overwhelmed by Jesus' incredible love. This woman was so overcome by the fact that Jesus loved her in spite of her sins. When we sin, we begin to wonder, does God still love me even though I've deliberately disobeyed him? Romans 5.8 says, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners if you want to know God's love for you look at Jesus dying on the cross when Jesus died on the cross since he was God in the flesh he could look into the future he could see the day you were born he could see the day that you're going to die and he knew the cumulative factor of all of your sin and he said I'm going here to die for all those commandments that you've broken And he took your sin and my sin, all of it, upon himself. And he said, I love you this much. You want to know how much God loves you? He's taken all of your hurts, all of your burns, all the punishment of hell for you on the cross. In Ephesians 3, the Apostle Paul said, And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, How wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Look again at the cross today and look at how much God loves you. In spite of your sin, he's calling you to himself. A third key to forgiveness that we learn from this woman is to genuinely repent of our sin. This woman was sincerely sorry for what she'd done. If she was a prostitute, perfume was one of the tools of her trade. And she poured it all out on the feet of Jesus. And it's as if she was saying, I'm not going to need this anymore. I think repentance is often the missing ingredient in Christian teaching today. You hear Christian teachers saying, the Lord loves you in spite of your sin. We're all God's children. The church is not a hotel for the saints, it's a hospital for sinners. You're all welcome here. And all of that's true. But Jesus said, unless you repent, you're going to perish. Repentance involves three words. The first word is conviction. I'm convicted that I'm wrong. I'm not the victim of my heredity or my environment. I have made wrong choices the second word is contrition I'm sorry not just because I've been caught I'm sorry because I've wounded the heart of God and I've hurt other people by my actions and the third word is change I'm going to re- going to turn from my rebellious ways and begin to walk in obedience I don't care how far I've gone down the wrong road I'm going to turn back from here 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 says, For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. Godly sorrow turns us around. Peter Marshall once prayed before the United States Senate, Lord, we thank you that we can come to you just as we are but remind us that we dare not leave as we came. God's heart is so tender that he can't resist a humble, repentant cry. In the Old Testament, King Ahab coveted Naboth's vineyard. Naboth wouldn't sell him the vineyard, so the king had Naboth killed, and he took the vineyard. 
God was so angry with Ahab because there was no king like Ahab who had done so much evil. God sent Elijah to Ahab and he said, I'm going to bring disaster on you. I'm going to consume your descendants and cut you off from your, from your kingdom. But do you know the end of the story? 1 Kings 21 verse 27 says, But when Ahab heard this message, he tore his clothing, dressed in burlap, and fasted. He even slept in burlap and went about in deep mourning. Now you would expect God to say, I'm not fooled by that fake repentance, Ahab. You have a record of idolatry and murdering people. You married Jezebel and brought all of her wickedness in here. You think this little act of repentance and fasting and praying will cause me to forgive you? Forget it. Not going to happen. But the next verse says, Then another message came from the Lord to Elijah. Do you see how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has done this, I will not do what I promised during his lifetime. It will happen to his sons. I will destroy his dynasty. God's heart is so tender that when we turn to him in repentance from the vilest sin, he responds in grace and love. Isaiah 66 verse 2 says, I will bless those who have humble and contrite hearts who tremble at my word. A.W. Tozer said, God loves the bent knee, the broken heart, and the wet eye. Another thing we should learn from this woman when we sin is God wants us to trust in his amazing grace. Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven, your faith has saved you. He didn't say your penance has saved you. If you do 400 hours of community service, I will save you. Her forgiveness was granted to her instantly by the grace of Jesus because she put her faith in him. Acts 15.11 says, We believe that we are all saved the same way, by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. In the comic strip, Dennis the Menace, Dennis and his friend Joey are leaving Mrs. Wilson's house with their hands full of cookies. Dennis said to Joey, Mrs. Wilson gives us cookies, not because we're nice, but because she is nice. And folks, God gives us grace because he is good, not because we're good. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you cannot take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. God promises, you put your faith in me. You put your trust in my goodness and I will save you. He wants us to believe in that. Not to question it, but to have faith in it. To be obedient of our salvation because he's promised it. Let's say that I bought tickets for Brandon and I for Sight and Sound Theater's presentation of Jesus. Brandon says, man, that sounds great. How much are the tickets? And I say, they're, they're already paid for. It's my gift to you. We're going to go together. A week later, Brandon calls me and he says, I got paid today. I don't want to miss that trip to Sight and Sound Theater. I'm ready to pay for the tickets. How much is it? I got tickets in the mail this week. They're paid for. No need to pay for them. A week later, Brandon calls me again. I heard the presentation of Jesus at Sight and Sound is almost sold out. I'm going to get online and I'm going to order my ticket. I say, Brandon, I told you. I already have your ticket. You're going with me. It's my gift to you. We're going to take your Harley, but I've already got the tickets. <laughs> and a week later, Brandon calls again asking about the ticket. And you know, eventually I'm going to get offended because Brandon doubts my honesty. Has it ever dawned on you that those sins that you committed years ago that you asked God to forgive you for, that he's guaranteed you they're forgiven? And when you keep bringing them up again and again and asking for forgiveness again and again, that you could weary the heart of God? You're doubting his integrity. But he promises in his word that if we confess our sins to him, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. And when we pray again and again over the same sin, what we're really saying is, God, I really don't believe that. So the next time you remember something from your past, something you've asked God to forgive you, maybe it's not the Holy Spirit that's prompting you. Maybe it's Satan 
that's prompting you. So instead of asking God to forgive you again, why don't you say, God, I thank you that your grace has already forgiven that. I thank you that you buried my sin in the deepest sea and you don't even fish in that area. Lord, I thank you that I've been washed white as snow and I believe that. And the last thing we ought to learn from this woman is to live as though you are forgiven. Live victoriously. Jesus said to this woman, now you go in peace. Jesus wanted her to have the assurance that she was forgiven. I doubt she lived a perfect life from that moment on, but she was moving in the right direction. And the Lord wanted her to be confident of that promise. Let me add a word, word of caution here. The grace is not to be exploited. This woman was to go in peace, but she wasn't to go back to her former way of life. You know, there are some Christians who exploit grace. They just shrug their shoulders and say, I'm going to do it anyway. God will forgive me. That's his nature. But Romans verse 6 reads, Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that we, when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Since we've been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. God doesn't expect you to be a perfect Christian. But he does expect you to be a sincere Christian. He wants you to live at peace. He wants you to be confident that you're forgiven. He wants you to live victoriously. God doesn't want you to live an intimidated Christian life. I wonder if I'm saved. I wonder if my sins are forgiven. He wants you to be at peace. He wants you to be a positive witness to the world that we have the victory through Jesus Christ. 1 John 5.13 says, I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. God's grace is overwhelming. Even though we're imperfect Christians, we're forgiven. We don't have to crawl out of church we can walk out of church even though we are imperfect, saying, what a grace-filled God we serve. I'm so glad that he loves me and has forgiven me in spite of my sin. Isn't God good? His grace is amazing. His grace is greater than all of our sin. And as we grow in Christ, we can live in confidence, knowing that our salvation is not dependent on our perfection or making the right choices all the time. Our salvation is totally dependent on the graciousness of the God that we serve. No one will ever love you more than Jesus Christ loves you right now. And he loves you just as you are. And if you come to him right now, he'll forgive you. He'll transform you. He'll take your weaknesses and make them his strength. And he'll empower you to live victoriously for him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your grace this morning. We thank you for your truth. But without truth, grace really doesn't mean much. And without grace, truth doesn't mean very much either. Lord, we thank you for the promise that you give us. That if we come to you and confess our sins, that you will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we thank you for the promise and the hope that we have through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus that we'll be celebrating this week. We celebrate every week, but especially this week. Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice of your Son. We thank you for the hope that we have and the confidence that we have in forgiveness and the resurrection of your Son that's available to each one of us to here today. Lord, if there's someone here this morning who does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, who's not confessed their sins to you, who's not confess their allegiance to you and made you Lord and Savior of their life. Lord, let today be that day for someone this morning 
that they too can live that victorious life having you and your son as their hope and their promise for eternity and to live in victory over their sin. Lord, we thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing, please. Thank you all for coming this morning, sharing your kids with us, sharing your kids with us this morning, sharing your kids with us during the week. Hope to see you all around a whole lot more often. I miss seeing you coming through the office in the hallways on mornings. Hopefully next year we can take care of all that. But we'd love to see you all back again. Um, I'm personally going to invite you. You're always welcome here anytime. Um, I will give you a heads up. I made several announcements about Easter. The Sunday after Easter, I picked on Brandon a little bit this morning. Brandon is going to be here representing the rescue mission. Uh, Brandon will be preaching that morning, sharing his vision with the rescue mission. We are really, really excited about that. There'll be a luncheon afterwards that we can spend some more time with Brandon and Casey. Uh, hopefully he'll bring some folks from the rescue mission with him. Love to have them come, come here as well. Uh, certainly invited to that. It'll be at 10 o'clock on the 24th. Uh, with that, we'll dismiss in prayer. Father, thank you for the wonderful day that you've given to us, the excitement that's been here this morning, the, the kids and the, the excitement that they have. And Lord, it's just great to see your house full this morning. Lord, we thank you and we love you for all things, but especially for your son, Jesus. And we pray for more opportunities this week to share his love and offer forgiveness and offer salvation to each one of us. Lord, thank you again. We just praise you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.